Hi there, you're listening to Prime Lenses. I'm Ian. My guest today is Rob Gray, also known as Polarity Photo. If you follow MotoGP at all, you've probably seen some of Rob's images if you're on the gram. Uh, For my money, he is the most interesting creative photographer working in uh, MotoGP photography today. Like, he's tremendous. Um, His images are vibrant and punchy and crisp and clear, but they also have like a painterly dreamlike quality to some of them as well. Um, I love his compositions. I don't know how you compose something that creative at 200 miles an hour, but he does. And he gets the personalities of the grid and the riders and the people around the sport, making it, you know, bringing it to life. And so as a huge MotoGP fan, when I saw his work, I was like, I've got to get Rob on the show. And because he is a good sort, he said yes. So I caught him in the week before the beginning of the season. So if you're listening to this and you know we're partway through the season by the time you listen, uh, don't worry, we recorded this at the beginning. We had no idea who was going to do well. Um, but it's going to be bad night, isn't it? Pekka's going to... Yeah, anyway. Okay, so without further ado, here is my really interesting conversation with Rob Gray of Polarity Photo. Yeah, no, when that preseason like seems shorter and shorter every year, almost the time between things ending and you know, like November and then now, it's almost no time at all. Yeah, especially last year, we finished in December, but did like the, mm. the very end of right. November, and then I actually went to um, Brad's wedding, one of the riders. So then yeah. that was in South Africa. So yeah, by the time I was home, home, and stopped traveling, uh, it was mid December. And bearing in mind I'd left in September, wow! You, you you know you come home and you think, okay, I've got six weeks. Um, yeah. In the middle of that, with Christmas and everything, you just it's amazing. You, you you've got all these goals and think, oh, I need to get this done. I need to get this done. You got yeah. Real life, house, family, but yeah. also your career goals and the yeah. things that you want to work on because mm-hmm. you don't just want to turn up at round one and be the same person you were before the same you know from a photography yeah. point of view so yeah it's it's one of those and then all of a sudden you're testing and you know we've already been to Malaysia and Qatar once so mm-hmm. it very much feels like uh we're underway now and I'm just trying to fit things in in the gaps yeah gosh no that is um yeah that's a lot uh, unsurprisingly I mean I think outside looking at, like I said massive I'm a massive MotoGP fan I did actually in 2011 uh mm. i bid on the day of champions auction oh, uh, awesome. in 2010 and i did so andrew northcott yeah who used to like i think he's off he's doing other he's doing model photography and stuff now i don't think he does the bikes anymore he's finished motor gp yeah 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 um but he i mean he was part of the furniture you know uh, i got that impression he'd been doing that for he he missed the days of film when like the day ended and you gave your bag of film to someone else and then you were yeah. off down the pub and that was so like, you know, great. Did, did you go out on track with Andrew? I did. Awesome. So it was, it was a weekend. It was a weekend of spending him reassuring people that I was supposed to be on that side of the rope because I was in the garage. It was Casey Stoner, Andrea De Vitiosa and um, Andrew and, and uh, Danny Pedrosa. Sorry. Yeah. And they were the, it was the, when they had the three bikes in the Honda wow. garage. And that was amazing. Like being stood next to Casey's bike when they turned it on and feeling that thump of the exhaust on your chest. Yeah, yeah. And just the power coming out the back of that thing. Oh, it was an amazing weekend. It was incredible. It was in Bruneau. You know um, what? That's so weird because I think I would have been in the crowd at that point oh, and wow. I, I know want it might have been I'd have to check. If it mm. wasn't then, it was 2012. Yeah. Um and it's weirdly one of the things that I would like to try and do one day is, is mm. just kind of like, you know, complete the story because I was in the crowd and I wanted to bid. I couldn't. I wasn't, you know, in a mm. position to because they go for decent money. It's a really good, you know, yes, um, a really good uh, auction prize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was desperate, you know, and I was in the crowd and I had I had um, I think I'd rented a lens at the time. And I was sitting in the crowd using it. And I always remember there were these lads who had had a few beers and they were like, go on, mate, you should you should uh, bid for it. It's like, there's no way. <laughs> but, you know, that was before yeah. I'd ever, you know, done anything media side um, mm. at all. So it's in the back of my mind that one day I'd like to get up on stage for that that Silverstone auction and offer the same thing to someone. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It would be pretty cool. Well, it was incredible. I remember, like, 
my wife, now wife, with my girlfriend at the time, and texting her from the Day of Champions and going, I may have just bid <laughs> 1700 pounds to, but and, and basically selling it on the basis of like people had bid two grand just to be on the grid easily, yeah. And That's so it actually, was actually excellent value, yeah. No, no, absolutely, yeah. So, was it was it a one day thing you did? It was the whole weekend, so you basically had wow. to get yourself to Bruno. Um, Friday, we could have sort of a, a wander around like the media area and get your passes and stuff like that. It was Saturday was shooting with Andrew. And then oh. Sunday was shooting uh, like on your own, but I still could go trackside. But he yeah. had a job to do Sunday, right? So yeah. it was like, you know, but um, and I turned up with like my Nikon D40 and my um, stepdad's borrowed 40D, right? <laughs> And then he took one look at that and was like, right. And he had a spare 1D body. Yeah. Uh, and so we stuck a prime on that and went round on the scooter uh, for the weekend. And uh, I got to play with those like 200 and 300 mil primes. And he basically just said, he was great. He was just like, put your memory card in and, um, you know, we'll, we'll just, that way you can just ch you pull your memory card out at the end of the day. And it was incredible because that I'd never shot with anything that fast before. Right. So mm -hmm. like a 1D, when you're used to like a consumer SLR and that's your entry point, you hold down the shutter for the first time and it fires off like a machine gun. Yeah. And and so it goes. And so I was going like crazy as these guys were coming around the corners. Uh, and he was just, you know, as I imagine, you know, it's like just bang, bang. And they yeah. were perfect. And they were in the center of the frame and the logos were there because they needed their they needed their sponsor stuff and they needed it for the press release like you know 20 right. minutes after the race finished and that was just it so yeah an amazing thing to experience because i went into it assuming oh it's going to be art and it's going to be creating things and that and andrew was like i want to take as few photos as possible and i want to get them i want them all to be good and i want as much done in camera as possible i don't yeah. want to be converting from raw i don't want to be like none of that it's jpeg straight out of camera i may adjust it slightly but he yeah. said i've got to have got it right in camera and that stayed with me for years for mm. years i have n i've not really shot like very i'm i'm very careful to press the shutter and like yeah. I, you know like so all these reviews like i I'm, the rico gr is one of my favorite cameras of all time and all the reviews okay, where yeah. people go you know like, oh the battery's terrible and it's like how many photos are you taking man? yeah yeah <laughs> like yeah i'm here to tell you with a point and shoot 28 mil camera like you either got it or you didn't it yeah. wasn't, you know, like the 800th shot was not the charm, yeah. right? Oh, that's super cool. What an experience. Oh, it's I, amazing. I, think, um, I reckon that might have been slightly early for me. I think mm. thinking about it, because I didn't really own a camera then, it would have been more like 2013, 14, yeah. I was going, you know, as a fan. Mm. Um, and I, I think I rented a, a, a camera. Uh, I rented yeah. a lens, sorry, to be able to shoot it. But yeah, um, yeah I've definitely been there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, wild. No, brilliant. Brilliant stuff. Well, you mentioned there being in the crowd like, like 2012, 2013, you borrowed a camera. What what made you do that in the first place if you weren't photographing much and it wasn't your job yet? What you know, what inspired you to do that? Well, I think so. So rewinding back before that, when I was um, kind of late teens, uh, I was into video before mm. photography. Yeah. And when I say into video, I mean, it's nothing really that sophisticated. I had an old um, uh, camcorder, like mm -hmm. an old Sony camcorder, and I used to just bring it with me and mess around. If me and my mates went somewhere, if we went away for the weekend or whatever, I would always be messing around and filming it. Mm -hmm. And then I got really into trying to edit them and make them look cool. And I'm really, you know, I've always been into technology. I've always loved um computers and what you can do with them and I, that was always my thing I was always kind of the the closet nerd if you like so I actually used to try and do things in Photoshop before I ever owned a camera and I would you know download images and try and learn how to manipulate them or change them or you know create basically create something cool I didn't know that I was actually just trying to find a creative outlet at the time I didn't know that's what it was but I guess this was just me at a young age, you know, finding these different things and enjoying different elements of it. Um, but at no point was I like, oh, one day I want to be a photographer. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that at that point. But uh, then fast forward to like racing, I, I'd always kind of been into motorsport and I went to Brands Hatch, which is like my local, my local circuit. And it was actually the first event I went to was the World Touring Cars. And I'll never forget 
this was like the first motorsport event I'd attended live and I heard the cars and got excited and then I walked down to like at Brands Hatch it's almost like a bit of a bowl where you're, you're kind of elevated above the circuit in most of the, the places and I walked down to basically where the start finishes and as they came past I remember the you know the hair standing up on my neck the, the noise the smell and I just knew from that moment that I was going to be at a racetrack very often in my future and I started going back to to brands not just for cars but also for bikes I got into British Superbike and I would go there you know for the weekend camping barbecues um, have a few drinks enjoy it you know and just basically in, enjoy the racing so I was a fan of that first if you like and then I can't remember exactly how it happened, but I borrowed a friend of a friend's camera because I wanted to try and, you know, take some pictures. And it kind of started there. I, I went to the track. I took some really bad pictures and I did my usual thing of doing some research and trying to work out, well, what are you supposed to do? How do you do this? You know, you Google and you look on YouTube, whatever. There wasn't a huge amount around, actually, at that time, but um, I became obsessed with with learning it and and definitely my angle was more the technology side I was more like look there's this device in front of me here and if you learn how to work it it will give you better results and and that was definitely my in that was where I started with like okay if I turn this button it does this if I change this it does this and that was literally the stepping stone to me kind of getting into what I do now it's tremendous it's so cool isn't it when something takes you like that and you're just like you don't know what you don't know it was missing you didn't know it was missing yeah. and then suddenly you're like oh no i'm a goner like it was, yeah. um, i was the first person i interviewed for this is a guy danny who i know and um, we've bonded over the years over like m's mostly and that yeah. and i remember going got my first m and you you kind of hear people talk about it like talismanic quality and you're like yeah whatever it's a camera and then you lift it to your eye that first time and you press the button you're like oh no i'm a goner yeah <laughs> but this, this no this speaks to me i get it and just yeah, I've actually used my M to photograph at Assen. Um, oh wow! The, it was it was hard, but you cheat. Yeah. You zone focus. You, you zone focus okay, and yeah. stick a long lens on, and then you're kind of, yeah. as long as it's sunny, you're all right. You get away with it. Yeah. Um, but you're you you know you're doing a different thing. But it's it's yeah, it's really cool to hear that like that was the the start. And how long was it after you picking up your that first camera and doing that you know borrowed lens, beg stealing and borrowing basically to get started? How long until you you know? picked it up professionally and were you what were you doing that you had to kind of stop doing to do this well it, it was a few years so I would I would still go along and enjoy the racing I would still go as a spectator and uh, enjoy the super bikes but then my focus became more around well how can I take a better picture so instead of like walking around the circuits looking for a cool place to sit it would be like oh well this this looks good or if I'm honest the first thing I did was look where, where the other photographers were just like everyone else does you know you kind of say okay they're, they're all gathering here maybe this is a good shot um and so then yeah I used to go around and try and find you know there were other circuits kind of local to me as well there's like the Thruxton's not too far away and I used to go up to Silverstone did Donington a few times as well so I would go to the these other circuits with the aim of taking better pictures and honestly I never said to myself, this is what I'm going to be doing for a job. Never, because I just, it seems way too far out of my reach. Um, I was working in IT at the time and I had, I'd had a number of jobs, had quite a long career in IT. I've done things like um, software testing, user requirements, um, building online systems, user research, um, all digital services, that side of things. And even some, some stint around support and infrastructure. So lots of different roles within that IT world. And certainly, you know, I loved it when I first started. That was what I was into. I was into computers and technology, and that was super cool. The, the photography thing just kind of started catching up. Um, and I used to take holiday uh, to go away and take photos of bikes. So let's say, for example, there was a race on at Silverstone for the weekend. Then I might take the Friday off, drive up there on the Thursday night, and then I'd be able to shoot. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, drive home and then go back to work on Monday. So it kind of that went on for years. Um, but like I said, I never really said this is going to be my my future. This is going to be my 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 job. I think kind of what happened was 
that I started doing quite well with the photography, started meeting new people. Um, I got my first kind of media accreditation for events and I started networking a little bit. And then I got to the point where I was kind of doing both jobs, but they were both being sacrificed in some way. You know, I wasn't able to fully commit to the photography because I had a full time job. So if I was approached by a potential client or anything, I would always have to say, actually, you know, this isn't my full time job. I'm doing something else. And that would happen quite often. Um, so there did come a point where I had to make the leap. I had to to make the decision to go. And that came around in the end. It was kind of just after COVID, around COVID time. So still fairly recent. Yeah. Wow. That's brilliant. You had to run the, the side by side is a real challenge, like the the transition of the side hustle into the main hustle. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot and of people it, do. Yeah. I think it's yeah. reality, you know. No, it's, for sure. It's, it's, quite a chicken and egg situation but you can't just um put your hand up and say oh i'm going to be a photographer now uh, you know yeah. where do i apply yes it's, it's totally you know most people are self-taught most people will spend their holiday or their time off going to the track and learning and trying to get better and then trying to meet people and, and having to balance that i'd say it's quite common yeah definitely and i would say like your work has a maturity to it that doesn't suggest that you've been doing it for like as short a period, relatively speaking, as that. Like it's it's incredible to see. Like you've got, I, I like that when we started talking, you were talking about like coming back different, coming back better every season, which is mm. great because that's that's the way the riders talk about it as well. Like it's the way athletes talk about it. So you've obviously got that mindset and that kind of quite precise, you know, approach or quite methodical, I suppose, approach to it um maybe i mean i can be quite chaotic as well but <laughs> i would say like for me and this is this is probably a gift and a curse and and i would imagine it's the same for so many creatives out there but i'm extremely critical of my own work to the point where like i do feel like if i'm coming back next season and i haven't improved anything or i haven't changed anything or i haven't learned anything or i'm not going to try anything different then i will feel bad I will be critical of myself and and it's kind of a sometimes it's good because it can push you forward it can drive you to have high standards and to to keep moving but at the same time you can give yourself much harder time than you really need to and maybe not give yourself the credit you deserve so like i say a bit of a gift and a curse but i would say it's more really from that than uh, than me being particularly methodical right yeah i just i was impressed when that like your um your videos of your studio and stuff like it does seem like everything has a place like it's all quite like sort of carefully laid out and like stuff stuff's together like can and kit look like it's together the fuji yeah, and yeah. look like they're together you know like you've got a a thought process behind stuff but like it's good that you'll embrace the chaos as well there's nothing worse than like being trapped by being quite methodical yeah. you'll see behind me like a bit of chaos you know like, yes just, yeah no way. i am absolutely i mean Quite a few of my colleagues will joke with me in that, that kind of in terms of my organization when it comes to the travel side of the job. Um, I'm probably the worst person <laughs> known to man, um, but uh, I manage somehow. I, I manage to get there with their help. But that's probably like a nice segue onto kind of the sort of the, the conceit, the excuse for the conversation, which is your first lens, which I think is a Sigma 120, well, was it? Yeah, so I put on there the Sigma. Mm. It's, a, it's a 120 to 300. It wasn't my first lens, but it was for me the first lens that really opened the door to be, be a, being able to take some good shots at a, at a motorsport track. Yeah. Um, because before that, I think my, my first ever lens was a, a freebie that I got from a forum. It was a Tamron 70 to 300. Uh, it was pretty bad lens it was beaten up um it maybe didn't focus particularly great i don't think i would have noticed though at the time um but it was fine it's, it got me to the got me to the track and it got me shooting so it was it was great and i stuck with that for quite a while that was the only lens i had the the body that i went for the first one this is after a lot of research and and looking around uh, i went in for a canon and i actually bought an import off of ebay because they're cheaper and it was basically the same specs as a 550d but i think the, the name was like a 
I forget T3I or something like well, that. Well, Rebel, they didn't have a Rebel name as well on yeah, import sometimes. Yeah, 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 the Rebel something. But it was basically a 550D, so crop camera. You know, not bad. I did I did my research. You know, for the money, for the budget, and everything. So that was me with my free lens, and I would go to the to Brands Hatch and, and try and shoot with that. But I mentioned the Sigma 120 to 300 because I remember quite distinctly this was the first lens that was a big big decision in in getting it and it was kind of like do you really want to invest more money into this it's definitely you know it's a hobby it's not going to go anywhere um but you really enjoy it and it you know it's it's a passion and it seems to be growing so it was i was very torn at the time um looking back it was a great decision and it was actually really good value and, and a very flexible lens. And again, I was quite proud of my, my research to find this, this one because a fixed aperture zoom lens is fairly rare, but to find one at that kind of longer focal length is even more rare. And I think around the budget was around a thousand pounds, something like that at the time, which is, you know, it's a lot of money. But relatively speaking, when you get to those longer lenses with fixed 2.8 apertures, it's actually very good value. So that was the one for me that I feel like it turned me from someone just taking pictures, you know, taking snaps to someone who's trying to get really good motorsport shots. Um, and I felt like I, you know, I could go to any track and I had the the right tools to try and take a good picture with it. Yeah. Plus something that which was was super cool with this lens. So you, I mean, you'll know this, but because it has a fixed aperture, it meant that I could put an extender on there. So I could put a, a 1.4 extender on there, which would extend my reach to 420, and I'd still be shooting at f4. All right. So in terms of flexibility, this was great. You know, in my eyes, I had the, the do it all lens. I could go anywhere from 120 mil all the way up to 420, um, and this was on a crop body as well. So I had a 1.6 crop factor on that. So in terms of like reach and flexibility, it was great. In terms of the budget, it was one of the better options. So I feel like for me, that was the one that was the one that kind of got me rolling. Yeah, that's lovely. Do you still have it? Is it got, or, no. or is it long gone? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's long gone now. Um, I do have a photo of me using it, which is, it, yeah. or, I would like oh, to look nice. at it every now and then because it's, it's young me for a start, but then I've got <laughs> this, I've got the lens and I'm shooting it through the fence um, yeah. at Silverstone. Oh, and cool. yeah, it just brings back cool memories really of, uh, of trying to get better pictures <laughs> yeah of a simpler time as well presumably because i imagine that was the last time you could travel light like truly travel light i yeah. guess because now yeah, yeah. the world of difference what's your well, kind of weekend setup look like now it's monstrous probably <laughs> yeah i mean it's wild i can i can share some photos and stuff if it helps but yeah i'll be i'll be taking you know at least i, I have two bodies plus a fixed um camera so I have uh, two Canon R3s, and I also take a Leica Q3 um, with me. And I have all the primes, you know, 35s, 50s, 85s, 135s, uh, 70 to 200 as well. Um, Off-camera flashes, two or three of those, light stands, soft boxes, modifiers, reflectors. Um, yeah, you name it, basically. It, yeah. it, it's all there. You're ready for any eventuality because presumably you don't just shoot like my my only contact as i said was with andrew that weekend and so obviously he was honda's photographer but he was yeah. predominantly shooting the bikes on the track like that was mostly yeah. what he was there to do most weekends are you kind of affiliated it looks like you work closely with ktm and you've worked with like pedro costa and people like that and you know brad quite well by the sounds of it like are you just their guy and you do a bunch of stuff or are you mostly on the bikes like how does that kind of work do you just have to be ready to to go on anything basically yeah, I, mean, I do everything. Um, so I am I'm a freelancer. So it just comes down to who I partnership with, you know, and who we agree to work with through the year. I do work closely with with KTM and some of the other riders, um, Fabio Quattararo. And then there's also things like brands and sponsors of the sport. So I'll work with them. And basically the idea is, is that I will cover their needs during the race weekend. And it's extremely varied. It is not just the track action. That's just, if anything, the easiest part. Um, there's obviously the there's portraits. There's 
it might be maybe a sponsor for example might want some photography work done if there's a new sponsor for a team it could be oil it could be anything spark plugs chains um you know energy drinks whatever it might be they might need photo shoots with the riders sometimes you have to do uh, like a good example would be the safety fleet cars for bmw i look after them as well and at the end of the day you know they're trying to sell cars so we'll do like fleet shoots at the start of the year where I'll either be in the back of a car doing the tracking shots or I might be up in a like a cherry picker doing like a big fleet shot. And then we try to get the riders interacting with them as well. So we'll have like planned shoots um, for that. It's extremely, extremely varied. You could also, I guess, describe some of it as documentary. For example, if a rider has to go to a fan zone or a signing session, then sometimes I'll go along with them and I'll document that and We'll be getting pictures of the fans and if, if we're up on stage for example silverstone being a really good example where they do the day of champions i'll always make sure that you know if my clients are up on stage there then of course i'll be covering that for them as well so that they can use it for their socials or you know whatever it might be so it's extremely varied and, and hence why the equipment list kind of grows because as much as i would like to travel light i could find a reason to to bring you know all this different kit for all the different types of shoots you might need um, and it changes you know each race weekend i'll have a different brief i'll have um i'll have a different job list today for example i spent an hour just going through my prep for next week when we go to qatar and i have um, a schedule timetable we have because it's the start of the season we have all the team shoots that need doing so we, we like to block those in and i have some other shoots that are going to be out on the track and you need to negotiate time slots for those to make sure the track is available and all those kind of things so it's very varied wow yeah it sounds really good i it, i can now see why you need like not just the big stuff but like the, something like a queue which is just absurdly versatile camera as well for like the size that it mm. takes up i guess as well like that you know the crop the macro mode the ability to drive a flash really fast like all in a small package like yeah that's really good. How have you find, found having the Q3 as part of over something like a, a, a 100B Fuji or, or something like that of other fixed lenses? Oh, I could talk all day about these. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, yeah, so I've got lots of experience. The Fuji X100V was the first ever fixed lens camera that I got. Hmm. So that was like my entry into the, the, the kind of what they call the everyday carry, you know, fixed lens. And I loved it. I actually fell in love with it. It was just and i still have it now and i still use it now it's a it's a brilliant 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 camera and i think before that if i kind of go back i was searching for something to be like that everyday carry where i kind of had like yeah there's the big bag with all your professional um 1dx's and and big lenses but i still wanted to have something else which was a little bit more kind of lifestyle documentary that was just kind of less thinking and less decision making and more just taking pictures and i experimented a bit with the fuji xt2 for a while and i enjoyed that that was great you know nice nice kind of small package good selection of lenses etc but when i got the x100v everything kind of clicked that was for me the first time where i realized the benefit of shooting with a prime lens for example where you don't have a zoom and you and then secondly where you can't change the lens and there's you know i could talk about that for days and kind of what that did for my photography moving from the x100v to first the q2 and now the q3 um they're different in my eyes you know that that you you might use them for the same reason but they have very different pros and cons i do pick up the leica more often than not the Leica is the one that will will come with me. I think it is slightly more versatile, and there's um, definitely a more dynamic range. Being full frame, you know, I can get more from the files, and it being wider as well means that I can, you know, you can just kind of capture more in there. Plus, with that huge sensor that's on there now, cropping is just very easy. But I still have use cases for my Fuji. For example, I mean, it's it's noticeably smaller and you can just put it in your pocket and you've got this like what is it 28 megapixel yeah uh, 35 mil beautiful camera with amazing jpeg straight out of camera 
that you can put in your pocket. Yeah, it's, it's so, unreasonable, isn't it, really? It's, it's it, the way yeah. I feel about the GR, like the Rico GR. Like that was, mm -hmm. especially during the pandemic, that was my every day around the house. You know, you can't go out, but you'll document your life. You can go macro, you can go wide. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and it's funny, I would spend, for years, I would meet photographers at events or at weddings and stuff like that, and we'd chat about, like, because I'd be there with my GR, just slung over my shoulder. And I'd talk about how oh, I wished it was 35 mil, not 28 because it was like mm -hmm. 35 is kind of like my favorite focal length. It's sort of yeah. the first camera I ever used was a Canon MC film camera that was a 35 F2.8. And to me, that's just what a photo should look like. You mm -hmm. know, it was like that. That's just kind of how it feels. And I think that just got baked yeah. into my brain from an early age. So I would. And so when the 3X came out, which is 40, I got that. Like my wife made fun of me. She was like, well, you can't complain about this thing that they've never done. And then when they do it, not get it like you yeah. have to. <laughs> you have to switch. Uh, and so I did, but I, I don't think I ever really loved the 40 mil version quite as much somehow, but right. it is unreasonably good for the size, yeah. right? Like it's, it's, it's that having, having something that's quick to start up really great image quality in the case of the GR3 IBIS as well, which is quite handy for like chasing little people around, but you can yeah. get really creative with it. And it feels like there's no, all the pressure's gone. There's no lens switching. There's no, like, have I got this set right? Like just, you've just got to, turn it on and go yeah and you know and and yeah fuji's film simulations are just it's just unreasonable like no yeah. one can get close you know like yeah. this they seem to be the only people who still care about jpegs straight out of camera like yeah, they, they're, they're surprisingly good and this is coming from someone yeah. like who has always shot raw and has always um tried to find the way to extract the maximum out of everything including the files yeah. you know so i was quite surprised at how good they were yeah, I had the first generation A7, Sony A7, and that was yeah. incredible for its size and portability and stuff. And, and again, my my go-to lens on that was that Zeiss 3528 that they have, which is like mm -hmm. tack sharp and tiny. So it kind of makes that thing really portable. But the JPEGs out of a first gen A7, jeezy peeps, yeah. they are bad. They are, <laughs> they're just, it's, it felt like a sacrifice. It felt to me like that product <laughs> came in a bit hot. You know, when, yeah, you, know yeah, when right. you get a product and you're like, this wasn't quite ready to ship, yeah. but you just had to, you had to ship it. And I yeah. think they just took the decision that they've taken ever since, which is like, just shoot raw. Everyone shoots raw. Yeah. Everyone wants that and it's fine. And you're like, yeah, yeah. It's, it yeah. is quite, um, quite the tool. But I yeah. think like for me, what changed was because I'd always been like, okay, I always want to have a camera with me. That's just, you know, I love, having a camera with me and whenever I was going somewhere I'd always be like oh okay which one do I take and what lens do I need and now I need a bag for it oh but what if this situation arises I'll bring the other lens and then I'll need a bigger bag you know and and it was that was kind of my life you know that was what I was doing and then going to something like this with this fixed lens it removes that and for me that's like quite scary because I'm like no I need all of this stuff I need a zoom I need something wide and I need the longer focal length but genuinely to anybody who is in similar to me who is kind of worrying about that and thinking no I'm always going to need a zoom or what if I need this just try it just try it because yeah. what it did for me was it taught me about 35 I learned about 35 and I and what I mean by that is I found shots that worked really well and I found shots that didn't work so well. And I learned how to play to those strengths. And I walked away kind of knowing I felt like, yeah, 35 is like something I've now got in my locker. I felt like I'd learned something new. I had a new tool. So even when I was using a zoom lens um, on a shoot or whatever, knowing what looks really cool at 35 helped me. And then I took that same approach for the other lenses that I then in the future got. So when I got a 50 and when I got an 85, I learned what looks super cool with them and what works with those particular focal lengths and the net result at the end is that I feel like I have greater knowledge you know I have a, a better understanding of the focal lengths so that's what kind of the Fuji did for me it was it mm. first of all it reduced the kit bag it reduced the decision making it got me out there taking pictures when I wouldn't have had a camera on me previously which is what we all want you know that's the goal right if 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 you can get pictures that you wouldn't normally get, then it's a successful camera. Um, and then kind of as an extra bonus, I felt like I learned a lot about the focal length and um, it forced me to to shoot a certain way. I had to move to where I needed to be to get the shot instead of zooming. And 
uh, yeah so for me it was like a, a great step for me and now I would never be without some kind of fixed lens you know camera hence the the Leica that I have on me now yeah I can see that this doing these series of interviews is going to be very expensive like I'm going to end <laughs> up talking because I have a I have a one camera rule like I try and because it's for that same reason that you're talking about of like the stress that comes with like well am I using the right lens am I doing yeah. so I've compromised on that a little bit so I have an M and I will swap lenses around rather than swap bodies and swap cameras I think if I had two cameras I'd get stressed now that the obviously the the exception there is my instant cameras but that's a whole there's a shelf of them. yeah right and yeah let's not get into my polaroids and my Instax <laughs> cameras yeah. I have a so forth and a so forth too like I'm I'm in deep at this okay. point <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but they're both excellent. Um, but yeah, so how did you find, because the one of the pleasures of doing this is going and looking at people's portfolios and what they've done in their back catalog and things like that. Your um, series of like images and short videos where you taking, we were taking an M around Tokyo, it looked like. That yeah. looked like a real change. Like your body language was different and like the, the things you were like, it looked like the things that were catching your eye and things you were curious about. Talk me through that because that, that's a, real busman's holiday but was that quite a refreshing experience to to use these things in a really different way yeah, absolutely yeah i think previously with the fuji especially and then the the leica i was using it a lot when i was riding my mountain bike because you know, i'm really into to mountain biking um, i'm not particularly good at it but i like doing it and the fuji easily fits in the little kind of pack that I take it was like no extra weight and I found myself like you know riding this beautiful countryside and and lovely sometimes you get really nice light coming through the trees and so I started taking cool pictures of my bike and I was like wow this is brilliant I get to ride and take pictures so that was kind of the most common use of of the the Fuji and then whenever I'm going to a circuit now obviously these are all around the world they're like some some uh, really cool places we don't often get time away from the circuit, but occasionally we do, especially when it's either a really long haul or there's like a back to back race. We tend to leave the first race and go immediately to the second destination and then you'll end up with a day off, you know, or, or a free day in between the two. And this is where something like I would end up using the Leica Q. And the Tokyo is is so wildly different to anything else that I would normally be doing, you know, just taking pictures of my bike in the woods or, you know, going for a coffee somewhere um, in England. It's just so vibrant and it, you know, everywhere you look, there's kind of like a, a photo opportunity. Interestingly, the first time I ever took pictures in Tokyo, I did have a DSLR. I didn't own um, a, a fixed camera at that point. And that was, a, you know, a bit of a pain it was a, you know i had the backpack and i had a big 1dx with a 16 to 35 it's quite a bulky set of kit lovely pictures you know and, and that was that was really cool but the difference when you're using something like the q doesn't have to be a like it could be any of the ones we've talked about the fuji yeah. uh, the rico whatever is you're kind of free you you can just move around like you normally would people don't look at you you know like you're taking a picture it's just kind of you're part of the scenery you're part of the the furniture and i feel like that enables you to to really just do what you want you know with the with the big body and the big lens it always felt like i was staging a shot it always felt like right now i need to make sure i've got the right composition and it's got to be at this time of day or it's got to be like this with the person walking across the frame here whatever it might be the difference for me with something like the Leica or any fixed camera is you can be walking along and you'll see a nice like bit of light or a cool shadow or a good scene and you'll just be there and you can just take the shot immediately. It just removes a lot of the, the stuff that slows you down and gets you straight to the good bit of taking pictures. So that's kind of, I mean, that's a general, I'd say it doesn't just apply to Tokyo, but Tokyo is yeah. a bit of a playground, you know, because it's just lots of lights and um really exciting kind of look and it's just so different yeah i think when you see when whenever you're somewhere un, unfamiliar like suddenly you see you see the world differently don't you like whereas you know like the first we moved to the highlands and the first few months here just uh, just trees all the trees all the light mm -hmm. all the like incredible things and now i'm just finding myself i'm like i'm kind of 
I was in London f- for the weekend a couple of weeks ago, and it was like it's actually quite nice to photograph something that isn't a tree. Like as, yeah, as right. beautiful as the Highlands is, it was yeah. quite nice to photograph some dirt and some yeah. like some some peeling posters off a wall, and you know the shard surrounded by cloud and sort of you know completely yeah. different thing. So from a kind of really light setup, because we've touched on your like your second of your three choices that you were going to talk about today, we've touched on the Fuji already. The four hundred prime is the antithesis of that really isn't mm. it of that kind of that small setup but how did how does that like fit in that seems like quite i looked it up like that's a special piece of kit yeah absolutely um yeah so the reason i listed that one as my my third one is i felt like i had to because it is the workhorse it is the bread and butter and it is the the most mandatory lens um that I have I, I'll, I'll qualify that you do not need to have the exact one <laughs> but you do need a long lens you need something with a lot of reach and if you're going to do if you're going to go to uh, a variety of different tracks with different layouts where you can't always predict how far away or close you're going to be to the subject you need the ability to have you know a long focal length so that's what I mean by that and and the one that I use at the moment the RF 400 2.8 the, the Canon is the workhorse that is the thing that does 90 percent of all the work out on track for me at every circuit uh, across the world so i had to list it because it's just you know it it's the uh, it's the workhorse basically yeah and do you monopod that up or do you hand hold it like slung across your back yeah. like how do you... I, yeah. I do monopod that but you don't have to um mm. plenty of my my colleagues um who also shoot the same thing will hand hold I'd say nowadays it's more common for new newcomers, you know, and, and um, youngsters, should we say, to handhold. The the cameras and the lenses are getting lighter. The the technology and stabilization is is really good now. I learn by using a monopod, and I've tried handholding it, and I can do it. But for me, it's actually how I shoot. I didn't realize this until I tested without the monopod. Um, but quite often what I will do is I'll get to the spot which I want to I want to shoot and I'll set up and the, re- the reason I like the monopod is I get to choose the height of the shot so let's say for example that it's a bit better to be lower on this particular shot or, you know or higher but let's say it's a lower shot if I was hand holding I wouldn't be able to stay in position and hold it lower while I wait and wait and wait for the subject so with a monopod, I can just set it at the correct height and wait. Then when I hear the subject or when I see them coming, I can then put my eye to the eyepiece and, you know, pan them in and shoot. So for me, it's kind of my style. It's like I will, I would like, I like to compose the shot, make sure that I have, you know, tick all the boxes, you know, clean background, that sort of thing. And the monopod helps me do that without having to stand at a stupid angle and, and like, or like break my back doing so. I think there are definitely some downsides to using the monopod and i notice them more on a sunday than i do any other day because they slow you down you know the the ability to to jump off the scooter walk up to the side of the track and bring the camera to your eye and take the shot and then go again is very important and it's also even more important for us on a sunday because we're shooting three races almost back to back and the idea obviously is to try and get a lot of variety and to cover the story of the race so you're on the move you're always moving around and if for me it takes me an extra say 45 seconds per stop and you times that by 12 or 13 stops during a race i've lost a considerable amount more time than you have where you're just taking the camera straight to your eye and taking that photo yeah, yeah and you'll end up where you want to be faster than than i will so there's a downside to using it, but I've tried both. And for me, I will use a, a monopod uh, because I believe like the the way I compose my images and the way I like to kind of set things up um, suits that style of shooting. Yeah, yeah. No, I think if you find something that works, like change it at your peril. You've got that set up. You've got that approach. Have you found that having the Saturday, like the, the, the sprint races now is changing your weekend quite a lot? Because it's obviously it's asking the teams and the riders to do quite a lot more which yeah. I don't know that all of the audience necessarily appreciate. Presumably it's a lot more a lot more important track time you've got to catch. Yeah, it changes my weekend, but maybe not how people would think. So 
if you kind of look at it from a net point of view, I would have been out on track anyway. It, you know, I would have been shooting something or I would have been in the pit lane or or in the box, whatever. So in terms of like how much I'm shooting, it's, you know, it's not a great change. But what it does do for me is it reduces the amount of time I have to be creative. Because there's a certain amount of shots and a certain amount of things that you kind of need to do to do the job. You know, you need to get specific shots of the riders. Um, if you're a, a track with some iconic positions, you need to tick them off the list and make sure that, you know, the client is getting everything that they need. By the time you get to kind of Saturday afternoon, sometimes I would have that kind of ability to say, all right, I, I can see where I'm at now in terms of what I've delivered so far. Maybe I'll use five to 10 minutes here to do something creative or take a risk. So if I find an angle that I like or a certain you know, composition or something I might not have tried before, quite often that's a risk, which means you know you, you could sink five to 10 minutes and not get something. And sometimes that's okay. If you've got the time, it doesn't matter. You know, I tried it, it didn't work. If it paid off, then great. But introducing the sprint race on the Saturday, what that's done is take that, that creative window away from me. And it's made it much more like boom, 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 go, 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 do this, do that, do that, get this job done, and then go and deliver the images. So that's really the main change for me. If I look on the positive side, though, try not to be too negative, there, there are some positives in that um, it gives us two opportunities to shoot the grid. OK, so that's really good because that's a one off normally on a weekend. It's a one off event where you get certain shots of the riders when they're preparing to start the race. So you get two shots at that, which is nice. You can try two different things. And also the race starts another one of those one off occasions during a race weekend and you get two opportunities. So depending on where your clients are in the group, in the pack then you can maybe roll the dice a little bit more and you can say, hey, you know what? I got the standard turn one shot where everyone was in the group yesterday. Now I'm going to go and do something cool. I'm going to try something and yeah. potentially risk not getting a good shot, but maybe getting something great instead, which I did, I did a couple of times last season. And, you know, sometimes it paid off. Yeah. No, nice. I, I guess also some of them might be in different, like quite wildly different positions on the grid depending oh, on like oh, yeah. the sprints the sprints have really rewarded some riders far more than others yes well i mean the, the grid positions tend to remain the same but the um the outcome of the races is com is completely yeah. different so the story of the race and <clears throat> where you might be is completely different also you don't want to deliver the same perspectives the same angles both days in a row so we try to come up with a different plan each day that that sees you extracting the most that you can from different areas of the circuit you know some of it you might have to repeat it's just you know if it's uh, for example uh, let's say last corner at thailand and during the last three or four laps there's a, a close battle for first then there's only really a couple of spots you want to be um, at the end of that race to make sure that you get the the photo finish, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a few places that you have to repeat, but otherwise you'll always try to do something different and to move yeah. around differently or, or, or work a different part of the circuit. Yeah. Oh, cool. We've had a lot of change recently as well, like the new guard, the switching of the guard in the pandemic and Mark being out for a long time. You know, Peko is now a two-time world champion, seems fairly unstoppable. He's, you know, Pedro is coming in. He seems like the real deal holy smokes people don't get on MotoGP bikes and look yeah. as comfortable as that as quickly as that he looks amazing right. who is there anyone you miss who's not on on the grid anymore like the, you know the likes of your cal crutch lows and you know going back a bit further or i guess because your timing of coming in probably times with some of these guys coming up from motor two and yeah and the likes yeah absolutely i mean i was always a cal fan that was, mm. you know, I, was a, I was a big big cal fan so um yeah it's always good to to see him on the track he, he's been mm. testing this year actually so that was quite yeah. cool uh, yeah. with yamaha he was in malaysia and, and qatar um obviously the big one who who retired um in 2021 would be valentino rossi mm -hmm. he definitely brings a certain um added kind of spice to yeah. to the weekends with the the support that he gets from the crowd um and when when he retired i actually you know got some of my favorite images of all time um 
when you know during that his last race and the last time he went back right. to the box so they were quite you know oh, quite big moments mm. um, but yeah definitely I think this year is looking really good I think it's looking really good there's lots of changes lots of interesting uh, dynamics going on and there's a lot of fast guys on fast bikes which is yeah I think it's going to be quite unpredictable yeah well I mean the Honda seems far far better than it was at the end of last season Yamaha seemed to have the right people in place like that new engine unsurprisingly with a bit of formula one fiddling from you know on the new engine lead seems to be doing the numbers but ducati just seemed to have had a step up mm-hmm. in a way that you know they were talking about it but it doesn't always show on track but it it's there and you've got track house joining aprilia which injects a bit of you know excitement and energy no it's i think it's gonna be an amazing season i'm looking forward to seeing mark on a on a ducati a bit more yeah. as well i think it was weird seeing him and pekka banyaya talking to each other that's very yeah. strange. Just seeing them yeah. chatting about the bike. And Pekka was like, yeah, you're still riding it like a Honda. You know, yeah, <laughs> like right, throwing, yeah. throwing the gentlest of shade <laughs> yeah. at the guy who's spent his entire life on a Honda, pretty much. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, cool. Really is, is there anyone you're looking forward to seeing more of this season to see what they do? I, I think for me, um, Pedro, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I, I really like his, his riding style. He... From a photographic point of view, he always looks fast. You know, he always yeah. looks good on the bike, which helps. Yeah. But um, just seeing him in person uh, ride that bike the way he has done, the way he's got on it, is is amazing. And mm. yeah, I, I'm I'm excited to to see him, and I'm very intrigued to see what will happen with Jorge and Peko again this year. Yeah, you know, I think peko as you said he's he's certainly on form he's a bit unstoppable at the moment or unshakable mm. very consistent mm. Jorge is extremely fast and he's got yeah. a lot of, of hunger and yeah and desire and i, I think that's going to make for a really good fight and then with mark moving to jacati as well i think that's going to it's going to answer a lot of questions for a lot of people mm. um, yeah. i don't think it will be as, as instant as a lot of people seem to say from the beginning like oh he's you know from day one he's gonna win the title or whatever um i might be wrong and i think that's mm. one thing i love about the sport is that it's unpredictable and nobody really knows yeah. but i think logically i would imagine that it would take him a bit of time because yeah. he has been riding honda for so long and the bike's completely different he has to adapt you know what made him good and what made him strong in the past he'll have to adapt and, and lean into that on this bike I believe he can do it, and I do believe he will be up the the sharp end. I just don't know personally how fast that will be. Yeah, um, and he's got a lot of other riders around him on. That is good the challenge, scenery. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I always felt that about Danny Pedrosa that like he should have been a world champion, but was just unfortunate that you know the likes of Lorenzo yeah. and a funny functional Valentino Rossi, and then Mark just turning up and winning his first season sort of set mm. a tone, and so you know always the bridesmaid somehow him and Dovey, like just never yeah. quite got exceptional rider absolutely oh yeah yeah i met him uh when i came to the to the grid that time it was like seven in the morning went into the honda trailer yeah. for a coffee and there is danny having his espresso with awesome. an expression on his face that says go away <laughs> like he was he was yeah. you know, it's the beginning because it's the beginning of his weekend preparation yeah and right. some some very bright eyed guy trailing around after the other guy comes in. And so, (laughs) yeah, yeah, that was when I was taken in to shake the hand of the team principal to make sure it was still okay for me to be there. Okay. And he he was just sat and he just didn't really look up and he went, "Mm," and just sort of nodded. And I I was allowed to stay for the day. It was going to be right. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Briefly. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Brief acceptance. That's great. What an honor though. Oh, it was, it was an incredible privilege. I would do it again tomorrow if I Mm. could. And, um, the people at Riders for Health do an incredible job. And I think uh, they did always say you could come back. Like if you've done it once and you didn't like run anyone over or make a prat of yourself, yeah, right. you know, you could basically pay the same again and come back and they'd figure it yeah. out. So you run uh, some, you have some courses online or some guidance for people who maybe want to start out getting better shots at motor uh, sports events. Can you want to talk yeah. a bit about that before we go? Yeah, sure. It's just a, like something aimed at really beginners or amateurs who who are just starting out and that would like to take better pictures at racetracks. Uh, so yeah, it's called the Speed of Light Academy. It's a fairly low key thing. There's a lot of online training, 
basically you sign up and you get access to a library of training videos which is me going through everything right from the types of cameras to look for the sort of features and functions how to set them up generally um you know the starting point and then all the way through the technique the techniques you use at the track to editing the pictures afterwards and then i've also got some kind of reverse engineering videos where i'll take some of my favorite images and break down how i took them the settings that i used the equipment that i used so yeah it's a bit of a, a library of stuff that you can dip in and out of um, to hopefully get you to a point where you're enjoying your photography more and taking better pictures mm. oh, that's so cool it would have been really handy I I look back on my experience and like I was taking photos at that track like yeah I my presence there was writing a check that my ability could not cash like, there's, <laughs> there's no there's no way I found a photo that um of Mark Marquez that I managed to get when he was still in Moto Two that I wish now using kind of a bit of upscaling and a bit of sharpening I can turn into more the photo I would have I wished it was yeah but right. like, it, I missed it on the day like I cut off his front wheel yeah. that's not well, that's the thing you know when I was starting out there wasn't really mm. a huge amount. Yeah. out there there was generic stuff but nothing that was really like saying hey you you want to take better motorsports images you know check this out and that was one of the the things that i wanted to try and do was to 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 appeal and to reach that particular you know group of people yeah yeah no there's a definite fustiness sometimes to kind of learning about cameras and photography and like you read it like i read it now after shooting for nearly 20 years and trying to be good at this and it makes sense now but it yeah. can't possibly make sense to you when you're starting. Like you need a mentor and or you need someone. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, do you know what? I, I think uh, so many people aren't very keen on sharing and I mm. don't know why, but when I was trying to learn it all, I felt like it was kind of wading through, through mud a lot of the time mm. because a lot of the people who were, who had cracked it and who had managed to do it, they weren't actually that keen to, to help and to share that info. Yeah. So hopefully this is something which um, breaks that mold and, help someone you know basically go and take better pictures yeah no and and i will like embarrass you slightly on on the recording now but like the photos you make are incredible like the range of they're not just the kind of very sharp almost clinical to some extent because you want you mm. know these are machines these are it's bright colors it's high contrast it's hard surfaces they're reflective like that it sort of invites a more clinical kind of approach but like your photos of you know the riders and like fabio or abio as he looks in some of the photos because he's just he's in great nick that man but like the, the painterly quality and the colors in some of your images it's just like they're breathtaking and i just look at those and it's like i was showing my wife when i was doing the prep for the for the conversation and stuff mm. and she was just like you're getting like wow like she was amazed that i was getting to talk to someone who makes him <laughs> like that so like thank nah. you for putting so much of that stuff online uh -huh. and it's really inspiring stuff to see no, thank you. I appreciate it. And, you know, the, for me, the the thing that I remind myself of and, and what drives me to to try and take better pictures is, is that motorcycle riding motorbikes are cool. And you want to try and capture that and keep that in the images because you can get very clinical. Like you say, you can get quite, you know, there's lots of generic shots out there of just a bike on a track. And honestly, a lot of them, it could be taken anywhere at any time of day or whatever. There's, there's, you know, it's very easy to completely strip out the story or the coolness around it. You know, if you remove the speed from an image, you don't know they were going fast. If you don't show the rider's uh, face, then you, you don't get anything around like maybe what's going through their mind at that point or, you know, the, the look in their eyes, whatever it might be. So there's certain things you can do to try and keep that in the images and at the end of the day i think motorcycle riding is is really cool and that's what i try to try to keep in the pictures and not to make it boring yeah no it's incredible the one of your ones of um i think it's a yamaha and maybe it might be sapang on the start finish straight like and, and there's like the bike is almost very small in comparison mm. to everything it's like it's really cool and it's moving really quickly yeah no oh, it's good no i mean i I'm in danger of just going through your back catalogue. You go, this one's yeah, really sure, good. Yeah, sure, do it. <laughs> yeah, there now starts the two-hour sequence of the podcast where we just yeah. bring up every one of your Absolutely, original. yeah, do it. You can uh, ping me a message, ask me how, how it was done. I'll tell you what camera and lens and settings and whatever. Well, on the subject of cameras, lenses and settings, you're the second person in a row to talk to, like, the Leica Q is really good, Ian. I'm like, oh, 
Like, I just, you know, I don't need to hear that. <laughs> well, I have the three here. Yeah. And yeah. I also have the X100V. Yeah. We well, see it was good timing that one as well, because the six, obviously, the internet is falling over itself for the six. Um, but I've got my trusty M11. Oh, um, lovely. I have been looking. A, you know, I, very good. I've i been looking at the M. Is the M11 the latest one? Yeah. 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 So I was looking and I'm just not sure whether I want to go down the manual focus route at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Because I, I do occasionally manual focus on this, but yes. only when I need to. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes it gets a bit funky. Yeah. And then what's recently caught my eye, and I am now obsessed, <laughs> and you know this is kind of like therapy, but I I think I might in in my future I see one, mm -hmm. and that is the Hasselblad. Oh X2D. wow! Yes, yeah. Now that I, is yeah, that's a weapon. I shouldn't get it, but I feel like I'm going <laughs> to get it. Um, well, the from a studio perspective like your rider portraits and things that you do with like lights and stuff like that. There's a lot of creative potential in a medium format with different types yeah. of lenses. You could go full plat on there and get in very close with like 135 mil lens and do all sorts of like really and interesting shutter portraits. as well. Be yeah. Nice yeah. With, yeah. Um, with the flashes. Yes. Um, like for example, I've got um, on Thursday, I've got to do the team shoot for mm. KTM. Yeah. It's like 40, 50 people it's it's outdoors it's with flashes um yeah. but it's low light yeah so you'd need quite a a slow shutter speed and all of this yeah. other stuff and i'm thinking oh that would be so cool if i could you know um run the flashes at full power using the leaf shutter yeah. and, and have yeah, yeah, yeah. high resolution but i don't know we'll see so I'm, I'm obsessed with researching it at the moment yeah um, uh, they they do sound very cool. It's funny. My um my stepdad sent me a link when the the Verge did their video of the Hasselblad, uh, the new kind of classic one that sort of modelled after the five hundred C. Yeah, and the he, look he was, down one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he was he sent me a link to it, and he was like, "This is weird. You'll love it <laughs> because he, yeah. he makes fun of me for having an M, uh, and he has he has an A seven C. But I will say, he got the seven C, and like incredibly capable camera, like wonderful lens great glass on that series of cameras now really good the number of buttons like i physically recoiled i couldn't do really? it anymore like this the manual focus on this has just ruined me for like more complicated cameras for a good wow. while i just because i love i got i got walked out of the leica store in new york practically for saying this but the <laughs> like they want to sell you a sumalux like the one on the front of your queue right like they yeah. you know go down to f1714 and like that's where photography lives and it's like I, I get what you mean but like i went to lights park last year and they let me play with a q2 monochrome mm. um and i ran around lights park and i looked at the images over dinner that night and i was sitting there thinking all i've really done is played with shallow depth of field and photographed a lot of blades of grass like i've not yeah. actually it didn't it didn't make the images better and the the corvette that was parked in the park car park at one point when i was running around playing with that and getting catching that and sort of experiments with that you know at like two eight five six far more interesting images you can yeah. still get a bit of fall off and focus on a thing that interests you or a bit of light but actually most of the time you don't need to be down at those focal yeah. at those, those apertures so like a, a 35 to 8 that's that small yeah. is is amazing for yeah. most of what you need yeah definitely so, so yeah i'm kind of i'm quite enjoying my sort can you of find that you can, can you focus fairly fast when you need to yes yeah, like but a also memory because I read I read people yeah, saying yeah. like, oh, you forget about it, and it's you do, you do. It feels faster. I mean, even to the point where when you use a digital like an autofocus camera afterwards, you're surprised at how slow it sometimes is. Now, not on a more modern one, like obviously like a the the A nines and the more modern A sevens and stuff, or on you know Canon stuff. I bet it's like lightning quick. But I do find that modern camera autofocus, especially in like in phones as well. They, they really are desperate to focus on the background sometimes in a way that like baffles me. Like sometimes they trip over themselves to kind of get the focus right. Like even the Q2 was doing that a little bit. But I do miss it sometimes for like um, the, the, what I miss more is the focal, uh, the minimum distance because it's 70 centimeters on a rangefinder oh. most of the time, unless you get their more modern lenses, which are 35, but then you can't focus to your eye 
you have to use the screen for that. Ah. So they they are compromised in loads of ways, but I think most of the time a 35 or a 50 on this, you mm. don't need to go lower than F2. Like you get some wonderful images. Oh, it's tempting. It is tempting. Yeah. But it's a style of shooting, right? Like that's the yeah. thing. It's like I I took this with my 90 mil lens to Assen last year, a 92.8. Mm -hmm. It was blazing hot that weekend, as you probably remember. And so I just set it to like F8, F11 and pointed it in the direction of Paco and got some yeah. passable shots. It's ones that I was happy with for the weekend yeah, right. that capture a bit of what's around. Like when he wins the race, like every, all the fireworks in the background are in the background of some of my shots. Right. And like if I went more, because creativity is all about iteration cycles. If I went more, I would get more of that kind of experience yeah. of because you also need that experience of like it's like doing the TT and they say it takes seven years to learn the track, right? Yeah, right. You've, got to, you've got to go, get the images back, live with them for a bit, and then go, oh, okay, you know. Yeah, you have to get it wrong before you get it right. And you don't learn what you like without experimentation. You have to shoot and shoot and shoot and mm -hmm. Mm. until you start defining okay this is this excites me this is cool this is what i like you know i'm going to do yeah. that again and that's you know how you end up developing your style and your look and mm -hmm. just getting out there shooting probably getting it yeah. wrong quite a lot if you're me oh. yeah. and uh, but then using that you know it, uh, there's a there's a quote that i love and i genuinely believe this is the, like played a big part for me is that the uh, the most successful people have lost the most, you know, or they, mm. they've, they failed the most, you know, and yeah. they're the ones who've got it wrong the most times because that's how you learn, you know, that's how you, how you get better. So for me, that's definitely always been my approach is like, just get out there and like try and take pictures of something. And then I always come back and be like, ah, oh, that was a bit rubbish, wouldn't it? Or like, why, you know, and, and you might, be annoyed about it that evening mm. or whatever but next time you go shoot you know why you know well that that didn't work oh it was backlit that time or the camera mm. doesn't like me doing that whatever it might yeah. be yeah um I, I using like this without without this on it i would take that yeah in my in my bike bag mm. and it's it's amazed me what i've ma managed to get like yeah. I'd be riding on my yeah. own and I'd have a self timer on and like pre you know pre-focusing on a mm. bit of thing and you know I've got pictures of me jumping and like cornering and like really cool stuff where I've just been like yeah. wow that's epic you know yeah 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 um but probably I'd say that makes up about 10 percent of the ones that I took yes because you know? the yeah. rest of them were just terrible you know and they delete them straight away but I yeah. learned how to get great stuff out of that camera and mm. that day you know that's that's an example of that it's just you know you going to assen with your 90 mil um but if you did that 10 times or you know five times or whatever yeah then oh you'd be surprised that yeah you'd see the progress for sure yeah absolutely yeah. and you, you yeah. wouldn't go oh no i didn't go to that spot because that was a waste of time it wasn't you know that sunk a lot of time in i didn't get much from it and you can I've, yeah it, it's the same iteration that we do at a race weekend mm. Mm. that's actually another point i didn't say earlier but when we have the two races the sprint and, the, and mm. the main race i tend to do better during the main race right. because i've kind of tested a few things out in the sprint race and like yeah. okay now that that did not work you know that was yeah got your eye in a bit i lost too much time going there and it wasn't worth it and, and so by the time you get to the sunday you probably you would have that's your fourth race you would have shot so yeah yeah by then you, you you're dialed in yeah, I think the other thing I have to remember, and and one of the reasons for doing these conversations as well is like as a as a very happy amateur, right? Like it's not my job. I don't have to get there. I don't have to get coverage. I shouldn't, you know, if I've got a bag full of stuff. There was a guy at the at the Assen weekend, and it was, you know, there's not when you're away from the the grandstands, like near the start finish stuff. There's not tons of um, protection from the sun. And we were walking back from one bit. We'd been to to stand on the hill and then walk back around because we had seats in the stands. And this guy was lugging the most enormous Peli case filled yeah. with Nikon gear, right? And he was, I'd say he was in his 60s and yeah. he loves it, right? But man alive, he, the sweat was pouring off him and he just found a bit of shade next to one of the toilet blocks just to kind of like stop for a sec. And I was like, man, yeah. just, are you all right? And he was like, yeah. yeah. And I showed him my camera and he just sort of chuckled. 
at what was there, you know? Um, and so, yeah, yeah it was... I forgot to say, actually, but like mm. when I was shooting as a fan and mm. I was trying to get better pictures and kind of going around Brands Hatch and the local tracks, you know, it got to a point where my main focus was to get better pictures, not not to watch the racing. Mm. And so I would go there with a plan, you know, where does the sun rise? Where does it set? Where do you want to start the day? And all that sort of thing. But I would I would take a day off work or go up on a Saturday and buy just buy a one day ticket. Yeah. I would drive up to Silverstone or Donington and put my, my bicycle in the boot, you know, and then uh, yeah. pedal around the circuit so I could get to so I could get to the spots, you know, somewhere like Silverstone's big place. Mm, yeah. Um and that was that was it. I had a my, my push bike, my backpack with all the gear, and then a little step ladder hanging off of it. Wow. And I used to just sort of pedal around, you know, get the step ladder, get over the fence, take the pictures, and then move on to the to the next spot. Um, so yeah, like, but that's that's it. You know, the more you get into it, then you end up with more gear, and then it's like, now you need to go to more places and and yeah. shoot more things. And yeah, oh, but what a wonderful life, right? What an amazing privilege to be there and to see these things happen like firsthand. You know? Yeah, I'm absolutely, grateful. extremely grateful to be able to do it and. I never thought I'd better call it my my job, to be honest. So uh, that's you know another reason why every year I want to try and make sure that I'm yeah. still getting better somehow and still learning. And because uh, you never know, you, you never know how long it will last and how long you can be doing it for. You know. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I really loved that post you posted at the beginning of the year, just with like trying to whittle it down to all those photos on Instagram. Yeah. And just and and just to, the sense of like the the joy and the acknowledgement of the great privilege that it is to be able to yeah. do it i think that's to, to meet people who are, don't take it for granted right like this is you you clearly don't and so i think yeah. that, that that makes it all the nicer and fulfilling to watch as, as a fan of the work right if someone is also clearly enjoying it and they've not had enough because like you meet yeah. people who've been doing something for a long time and like they're just like you've had enough but like, i wouldn't <laughs> yeah. think that's my main job. And the industry is filled with people who have like, they've had enough, right? That the, the yeah, industry has absolutely. treated them. It's been a hard, it's a hard place to work. So, you know, um, especially right now. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, it's really, it's lovely to yeah. see. I mean, there, there's obviously, the, as with any job, there are hard parts and there are bits that you don't like as much as the the good bits. I think that's normal. Yeah. Um, and the more you do it, then you can get a little bit weathered and seasoned to, to the experience. And, mm. you know, the the good thing is that for me at the heart of it is I obviously love photography so much because even mm. even when I come home and I'm not out there shooting, it's on my mind and I want to try yeah. and I'm a bit of a nightmare when we're out of season because yeah. I feel like I should be creating. Mm. Um, and maybe that's a bad thing sometimes, but I almost feel like a pressure to, right. to like, oh, hang on a minute. You know, I've gone from high paced delivery, um, sharing content, delivering images, creating yeah. to to not needing to mm. all of a sudden. Mm. And yeah. uh, I actually struggle with that quite a bit. I, you know, I'm still trying to to find out the right the right balance with it. But the, yeah. the Academy helps, the Speed of Light Academy helps yeah, because yeah. I, I kind of sink into that and and talk to my members more and and we we do a few kind of uh, events. Mm -hmm. uh, and competitions and stuff like that but but yeah I do struggle with that feeling of like I oh, know I need to be out there creating I need to be doing something so obviously enjoy it and love it enough mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that every year I go back I still want to do a good job even though there are some hard parts to it like with the travel and the time away from home yeah and, yeah and those things yeah oh super cool well thanks again man that was a really great conversation and yeah. um yeah, I will you. edit it together. Oh no, it's an absolute, absolute treat. Um, so I will, I will hit end record, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing your photos through the season. Have a great one. Thank you, mate. Take care. Thanks a lot. A massive thank you to Rob from Polarity Photo there for taking some time to talk to me about his favourite lenses and what got him started. So I'm really hopeful that he is now uh, not feeling too stressed getting back out in the travelling circus that is the MotoGP travelling around the world, living out of suitcases and following the most exciting motorsport on the planet. Um, I'm only a little bit jealous. Just a bit. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it too. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.